Today I'm going to gallop through the complex area of immigration law. I'm going to be guided by Louis McWilliam, who is an employment solicitor at Black's Solicitors in Leeds. In fact, I'm doing a bit of a disservice there to Louis. He is in fact the head of immigration law at Black's Solicitors. For those who don't know Black's, um, I only know them a little bit, but they are a rapidly growing Leeds law firm. Not that many years ago, I think they had about, about 10 people, and now they're at about 250, which is just phenomenal growth. They do so in most areas of law, as I understand it. Uh, but they didn't do immigration law until recently, when Louis joined. Um, Louis, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Now, immigration law is a hot political topic, and we're not going to get into the, the politics of it, but we will need to touch upon matters such as Brexit and whether a no deal or, or managed deal or whatever it's going to be is uh, going to change immigration law. But before we go into all that, could you just tell my listeners all there is to know legal-wise, about Louis, the lawyer. Okay, so I came into immigration law fairly late on in life. I'd, I'd spent my 20s trying to figure out what to do before going and doing a master's degree in human rights, which set me off on this path, initially doing work assisting asylum seekers as a paralegal at an NGO in Bradford. Unfortunately, the, the legal aid cuts kicked in around 2012 so various big NGOs went bust so I had to move initially to Hull and then down to London where I completed my training contract at a quite a well-known human rights law firm called Bindman's. I was taken on as a solicitor there and then lifestyle choices meant I really had to leave so I had a I had a child and the usual kind of London story of insane, insanely high rent prices. So I moved back up to Leeds. I heard that blacks were looking to start an immigration team. And so I started on the 30th of April last year. And here I am. Thank you. So black solicitors, do you have a legal aid offering for immigration law? I'm assuming not, but because um, it normally used to be legal aid and now it isn't, but could you correct me and my audience please? Yeah, sure. So blacks no longer do legal aid. I believe they, they did do legal aid for uh, certainly crime, possibly other areas, but I think a while ago, like a lot of law firms, it became just financially not viable. So they, they only do private work and therefore I no longer do legal aid work. In actual fact, the, the, the kind of um, areas which legal aid now covers for immigration is very strict anyway, very narrow. So you're talking only asylum within the, the field of immigration. So it's just people claiming asylum or, or I think, uh, victims of domestic violence as well, or human trafficking. Thank you. Could you help me with some terms? I vaguely understand some of the immigration terms, but I imagine most people don't, and I also bet that I've got it confused. What's the difference between a refugee, a migrant, an asylum seeker, an EU national, which I kind of know, but could yeah. you give us some definitions, please? You know, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a lot of confusion around what the different types of immigrants you can have here. So uh, an immigrant is anyone from outside the UK, a, a non, non-British person. And within that, there's, there's various kind of subcategories, which are really quite different. So you could have, on the one hand, an asylum seeker, which is someone who is claiming that their life's in danger in their home country for, for certain reasons. If their claim's accepted as being genuine, then they're recognised as a refugee. And quite often these are people from, from countries which are having fairly serious socio-economic problems. Then within um, the, the other kind of economic migration, you can have people just coming here to work, so they might be coming here in some kind of work-based capacity. If they're coming from outside of the EU, then they would need to be sponsored by uh, an employer with a sponsor license. If they're coming from within the EU, then that's fine. At the moment, they can come under free movement provisions. So they can, they, they just have to, if someone from the EU just flashes their passport and they're in, in the UK, and then likewise, they, they show their employer their passport and they can commence employment straight away. There's also students obviously coming here to, to study at university. They will have quite tight restrictions in terms of the work they can do. So they can work only 20 hours a week during the term time, or they can work 40 hours a week during the summertime. 
So there's, yeah, there's quite a broad spectrum, and then you'll quite often hear about illegal immigrants, which, which refers to people who have no lawful basis of staying in the, in the UK. So that could be that they entered the UK illegally and didn't regularise their position, or they've, they've overstayed their visa. Understood. Now, can, this is a silly question, but I'll ask it anyway, can asylum seekers and refugees, can they work here? And if so, how can they work here? What paperwork would they need? So the government's really cracked down on this area. So there are, there are very limited circumstances when an asylum seeker can work. So first of all, there has to be a delay on their asylum claim. And I think it's currently of over a year. Okay, so that's the first rule. The second rule is that they can only take a job which is on the shortage occupation list. Okay, now The shortage occupation list is a list of recognised jobs which, which there's just huge shortages of, which can't be filled by what they call settled workers, so someone from the UK or the EU. Uh, so we're talking very technical engineers, um, doctors and nurses have recently been added to the list. Uh, so in, in practice, I would imagine virtually zero asylum seekers are going to fit this definition of jobs which are on the shortage occupation list. So in theory, in certain, in certain circumstances, they can in practice, not really. Understood, more or less. It is, as you say, massively technical. Yeah. Now, I was watching on BBC News website recently a speech by an MP from Birmingham and she was talking about this £30,000 level allowing people to live and work in the UK. I didn't fully understand what she was talking about, but I seemed I was a bit angry at yeah. the screen. So you don't need to necessarily be angry, but could you explain this £30,000 level, how it interacts with yeah. immigration law? Sure. I mean, I, I think this is Jess Phillips, who I, I didn't listen to her speech. I read about the speech in, in, in The Guardian, and apparently it was an incredible speech where she... She, um, I think she was quite critical of MPs who had more money than sense. <laughs> oh, it was. And she actually quipped that she didn't. She thought that she was middle class until she came to House of Commons, and she then realised that the people that she knew just liked olives. They weren't really. Yeah. <laughs> and she she talked about herself as a scully maid. She realised she was just a scully maid. That's right. Um, so yeah, what what she was referring to is the new immigration bill, which is currently going through Parliament, and it just went through the second reading, which is what uh, Jess Phillips was, was talking around that, that moment in time. What the government's proposing to do is, obviously, free movement will end, well, I say obviously, so let me start again, free movement will end when Britain um, leaves the EU officially. Technically it ends, but it will, it will, to all intents and purposes, continue until December 2020, provided there's a deal. Okay, we can talk about that maybe later. When that finishes, the new immigration model kicks in. So this is January 2021. EU nationals are going to have to be sponsored just as non-EU nationals. So just as someone from India currently is, in the future someone from France will also need to be sponsored. And what the government's proposing is that there's going to be a minimum salary threshold. So someone, if the French national will have to be earning X amount of money. Theresa May personally wants that to be £30,000. Okay, so that's, that's her favoured limit. There's a bit of opposition there, so it's gonna, there's going to be a consultation around that. But if it is £30,000, then we're talking about, apparently that's the 25th percentile of earnings, so it's going to knock out three quarters of the working population. Wow. Because the average income in the country, I think, is about twenty-seven thousand. I think. Is that right? I think it's skewed massively by, by London, London as well. Yeah, so right. I mean, that, a lot. and that's going to be huge, particularly you know up north in Yorkshire. Yeah, uh, no doubt. Now, thank you for clarifying that. You mentioned those that word Brexit. If Theresa May's deal, you know, is successful, and it may well be, but I don't think it will. Is, it, is this where the thirty thousand pound limit kicks in there, or are there any others? Um, machinations of immigration law which will all turn on her deal being successful. Or sure. Not. So, I mean, there's really all to play for in terms of immigration, depending on whether there's a deal or no deal. So, if there's a deal, then, like I say, free movement will essentially be preserved until December 2020. By that, I mean that EU nationals can still come to live in the UK. All they'll have to do is register under this EU settlement scheme. 
Okay? So aside from that requirement to register, it's still effectively free movement. Okay? In fact, we can maybe talk about how everyone, all EU nationals currently, ha currently here, also have to register under that scheme anyway. But any new, un under a deal, any new arrivals arriving up until December 2020 can come here effectively under free movement, but will have to register. Got it. Okay. Louis, I, I spoke to you before the podcast commenced to say that quite a lot of my staff, you know, our staff here are, are Polish, mm. um, and we represent, or well, a third of our clients are Polish, in fact. So is it then your advice to say that, that all those people, assuming that they are EU nationals, should you know, register now? Yeah. I mean, maybe... What are the costs as well? Yeah. So maybe it's worth, before I talk about the kind of no deal and um, deal scenarios, just say, well, what the situation is for everyone currently here. Please do. Okay, so all EU nationals, regardless of whether they have permanent residence documents, for example, they, everyone has to register under the EU settlement scheme, which is this mandatory system of registration. It opened, I think, on the 21st of January... There is quite a wide window to register, so we're talking about June 2020. Okay, so it's not like everyone has to immediately register, Good. but they, they must register. And I think a lot of people aren't aware of that, a lot of employers aren't aware of that, and certainly a lot of EU citizens aren't aware of this. Now, the, the cost was going to be £65, okay, so it's not a huge amount of money, but a lot of people will wonder why we're making long-term EU citizens who have paid their taxes, contributed to society, why are they paying for the right to continue living here? I was going to ask that question. <laughs> okay, well, I got in there first. Uh, there has been a slight development. So as part of the, the Brexit negotiations, which was defeated, uh, was that a couple of weeks ago? It was. Um, Theresa May dropped the £65 fee, so that it's, it's now free of charge. Good, Which is it should be. Which is interesting that it took... Yeah, I mean, I, I personally feel like it's there's an element of using EU citizens as bargaining chips here because the, the government introduced that fee in the first place. But, yeah, so the, the bottom line is it's now free. Got it. And it, what happens to those who've paid the £65 already? Will they be able to reclaim it? Good question. I'm not sure about okay, that. Okay, no problem. So EU citizens, you heard it here, you know, register, deal or no deal. Yeah. And, and okay, you've got to... You've got some months to, to do that, so no major rush, but do it. What happens if they don't do it, you think? I mean, it's hard to know whether they have a current law. Well, I mean, no, I mean, we are, it is clear that if they don't register by the deadline, that they will be living here without any lawful basis and, and they'll be overstaying. So, in the same way that if someone from outside the EU, so I keep picking on Indian nationals, I'm not, I'm not sure why, but if, if an Indian national comes here on a visa and it expires, and they don't renew their visa, they're overstaying. EU nationals, they never traditionally needed paperwork because it was a rights-based system. But now, if they're not registered by this cut-off date, then they're here overstaying just like any, any other migrant. Well, you used the term overstaying, sure, and it just sounds like, well, I'll just stay here a little bit longer. Does it have you know, greater ramification? Like, I mean, is it a criminal it, matter? It, it's a criminal offence, yes. It's an immigration and criminal offence, as I understand it, you're unlikely to be imprisoned for a short period of overstaying, but it is a criminal matter, and you're going to seriously jeopardise your ability to stay in the UK long term if you're overstaying. Okay, so significant periods of overstaying, unless you might have like a British child here, sometimes you can kind of get around that overstaying, but it's it can be fatal to your ability to stay in the UK long term. Now it must be impossible doing your job at the moment because it seems that the law is changing almost on a weekly basis and you know even if something doesn't get past the, the 65 pounds and then the 65 pounds is now canned and so on is it actually possible to do your job at the moment? I mean should people see immigration lawyers at the moment given the uncertainties around it's a difficult question for you but you know should we waste our money on you now uh, well of course you should okay. <laughs> um, the, the immigration position had been fairly settled quite a while back, okay. so a lot of the Brexit turmoil is around stuff like the Irish border and around trade. The immigration aspect had been agreed a long time ago in terms of um, citizens' rights. So I'd been fairly confidently talking to people about these upcoming changes. Now what, what did come as a bit of, bit of a surprise is recent Home Office policy 
in how new arrivals will be treated if there's a no deal, which seems fairly severe, and we can talk about that. So to answer your question, I mean, it's now is a good time to be preparing for Brexit and taking measures, whether you're an individual to secure your status, okay, whether you're an, an EU national or the family member of an EU national, or if you're an employer, to start to, to take advice about how Brexit's going to affect your business. Got it. And there aren't many immigration lawyers. I can think of two that I know, and you're <laughs> one of them, and it's the first time I've met yeah. them. There are not many of you knocking around, so it must be sort of boom time for you all. I suppose sadly, but you know, so it's good for you, I suppose, but you know, not so good for those having to go through uh, the process. Um, could you talk to us about employers? So we do have some employers that listen to the podcast. What specifically should employers be doing right now, or maybe post deal or no deal? Yeah. So, I mean, as a minimum, employers, if, if you've got EU nationals currently working for you, you need to be getting familiar with the EU settlement scheme, this registration scheme that I'm talking about. I mean, it, it, it is the responsibility of the migrant to register. However, it can become your problem as an employer if your employees don't register. Because, as I, as I mentioned, if they don't register, then they're overstaying. And now if you're employing a migrant who doesn't have any lawful basis to be here, then you can fall foul of the prevention of illegal working regime. So, so uh, you, I don't know if people know that an employer who's found to be employing an illegal migrant will, can face a, a fine of up to £20,000 per migrant. So there are pretty big implications if your employees aren't sorting their immigration status out. But I think maybe more importantly is, is if you can help your employees, then there's a lot of EU nationals are really worried about what the future holds. I certainly don't want to be scaremongering today because in fact, as long as EU nationals comply with the scheme, then it's actually, I mean, notwithstanding the fact, you know, Brexit's happening, it's not a bad scheme. So EU nationals can continue to work here, they get indefinite leave after five years. But there is a problem with EU nationals thinking maybe things are worse than they are, so there's record numbers of EU nationals leaving the UK. So as an employer, you can play an important role in making sure your employees are fully familiar with the scheme and, and guiding them through this process. I suppose chillax a little bit as well, it seems to me. Yeah. That, you know, don't leave, you are welcome absolutely, here. Absolutely, absolutely. still in these forms, etc., yeah. etc. Et That's good to know. That's sound advice, and you know, I haven't heard it put like that before. Um, I'm very much into a politics, I listen to the debates, but I do find the stuff around immigration technically very complicated, even as a lawyer, so those who aren't, they must be you know, very trying indeed. Now, how about landlords? You know, just talk to me about the, generally speaking, what landlords need to be doing with their, their tenants um, currently, and if there's going to be any changes. Well, so so the, um, the, the position with landlords is similar to the position with employers in that you have to be undertaking checks to ensure that your tenants have have the right to reside in the UK. So you'd have to be taking uh, a checking ID in the same kind of way that an employer has to. And I guess the, the implications are the same really in terms of tenancy. So if, if, if you have an EU national who's not registered by the cutoff point, then this could be problematic for a landlord as well. Got it. Thank you. It's getting clearer in my mind. It genuinely is. <laughs> I mean, do you have any sort of final sort of top tips for anyone listening to this podcast considering immigration, other than I'm sure call William and William at <laughs> Black Clusters, which is totally fine, and, and I hope people do. But anything else, any um, websites that they should be reading, uh, home office websites, I mean, are they easy to, to navigate? I'm, I'm going to assume that they're not. <laughs> but, um, you know, are there any blogs where people can get extra information? Um, because just, just to be equipped before maybe they make the call to you or anything. Yeah, sure. Like so... The Home Office does have, um, it sends out regular updates regarding the whole Brexit situation. So you can sign up on the Home Office website if you, if you look for UKVI, which is UK Visas and Immigration, and if you search for the EU Settlement Scheme, you can, uh, you can subscribe and you'll get regular updates there. There's an excellent website called freemovement.org, which has several blogs coming out daily. Many of them are around Brexit as well. Um, and it, it's a really good source of information in terms of, of what EU nationals can do next. Super. Well, the floor is yours, Louis, as we come to the end of the podcast. Is there 
any questions I've not asked you, anything you want to say, this is, this is your moment, and maybe we've done it all. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really covered the, the key areas, I guess. I mean, a lot of EU nationals will be wondering what to do next. The main message I want to get across is that you know, the position is fine as long as you register under this scheme. Okay, so I don't want to send, set unnecessary alarm. You haven't done. You've been yeah, done. okay. And you know, in a lot of EU nationals, if their long-term future is in the UK, then they'll want to become British. So they might want to consider how they can apply for British citizenship as soon as possible. This might involve getting a permanent residence card, which is a prerequisite for becoming British. So really looking into how to do this sooner rather than later. So although I don't want to set alarm around Brexit, I mean, if your long-term future is here, you probably want to become British sooner rather than later. The other thing I'll say is that the cost of becoming British has increased in the last seven years from £600 to £1,400. Oh, so, yeah, you might not want to hang about any longer and, and crack on with it. It's likely to go up again. It absolutely. goes up well above inflation every year. So, yeah, and I'd certainly recommend people to look into that. And to become British then, is there a citizenship test required? Life in the UK test. So Life in the UK, OK. And Andrew, I'll ask you, how oh. many how many, me- <laughs> how many members are there in the Northern Ireland Assembly? I drove past it recently in Northern Ireland, <laughs> genuinely, I was there for my birthday. How many numbers are there? Sitting at the moment, zero. Well, that, that's the correct answer. Thank you. Yeah. But no, seriously, that is a question that's asked in the Life in the UK exam. So, fairly random stuff in there. Okay, if it was sitting, how many people... Yeah, I don't know the answer. <laughs> maybe 60? Yeah, sounds about... I mean, I guess it's less than Scotland, so maybe even fewer than that. Okay, goodness. So, you really need to sort of tool up before... Yeah, no, I, th- I think test. when they do the test, they actually give you a booklet which has the information within there, so it's not as, as difficult of, as, as what I've maybe made out. There is an English language test, which is maybe more of a challenge for some people. Gotcha. All right. Um, thank you. Louis, anything else for me? No, I think that's it. No, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Well, I think we, we've done what I said we were going to do, which is learn about the basics of immigration law. And you set out some of the definitions. Thank you. Um, you've made me as an employer a more uh, alert or told them I didn't know, in fact, of this settlement scheme. So thank you for that. I talked to my colleagues. I'll pass on this podcast to the people I work with so that they can send it as well to um, the people that are calling us with these sorts of questions. Um, but finally, um, Louis, how do people contact you? Do you free to give your email address or a mobile number? or how, how, how should people get you at Flex? Yeah, I mean, so I'm happy to speak to anyone on the telephone. So feel free to call me for, a, for an informal kind of no obligation chat. They can also email me. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter as well. I also run seminars fairly regularly so if you check out the blacks website you'll be able to see seminars particularly around brexit and the future of immigration super louis thank you very much for your time today